In 1992, Kurt Cobain was once asked about Endless Nameless, the hidden track which closes off Nevermind. He had the following to say about the song. It's a little taste of what our next album might sound like. That next studio album, of course, would be In Utero, and the second track off of In Utero is Sentless Apprentice. The opening song on the album is Serve the Servant, and although it's a great song, in terms of Nirvana's heavier side, it does not compare to Sentless Apprentice. Sentless Apprentice is a very abrasive, in-your-face song. It's the first track on In Utero, in my opinion, that really goes back to the Bleach-era roots of Nirvana. A lot was made of the production on Nevermind. For some people, it was too polished, it was too mainstream. The band had gone too commercial with that album. And so In Utero, in a lot of ways, was a response to this. It was meant to be more abrasive, more in your face, and Sentless Apprentice, to me, is a prime example of this. One of the interesting things about Sentless Apprentice is that it's the only song on In Utero where all three band members have songwriting credits. Dave Grohl joined Nirvana in late 1990, and by that point, Chad Channing had already written a lot of the drum parts for the songs that would appear on Nevermind. In Utero would be the first and last time there would be a full studio record where Dave Grohl wrote all the drum parts for a Nirvana record. And arguably, the most distinctive drum beat on all the songs on In Utero is the opening beat on Sentless Apprentice. Steve Albini is the man who produced In Utero, or as he would say, recorded In Utero. I did an interview with Steve a little while back about the creation of that record, and during this interview he spoke about how Dave Grohl's drumming on Sunless Apprentice really stuck out to him. I'm going to show you guys a clip from that later on in this video here. In addition to the drum parts on Sunless Apprentice, Dave Grohl also came up with the main guitar riff in the song, an early indication of his abilities on the guitar. Though, interestingly, Kurt Cobain was apprehensive at first about this riff. He wasn't a huge fan of it. In Kurt's words, he felt that the riff was a bit cliche, but ultimately decided to go ahead with it because he liked Dave and he felt it'd be good for band morale. Kurt has publicly stated that, particularly by this point in his career, he liked getting creative input from his bandmates as it took some of the pressure off of him to come up with the songs. Now, interestingly, though Dave Grohl wrote the drum parts for Sentence Apprentice, the first known recording of the song does not feature Dave Grohl on the drums. The first known recording of Sentence Apprentice comes from a jam session Chris Novoselic and Dave Grohl had with Ray Washman. Ray Washman having been the drummer in Tad, Scratch Acid, and more. Now, in this jam session recording, Ray Washman played the drums, and Dave Grohl played guitar. In 2019, Ray Washman recalled the following. Dave was obviously new to guitar, but had some songs he wanted to try out with a band. I had just quit playing in Tad, and Dave asked me to come over and jam. I had never met Dave or Kurt and Chris, even though I had heard Kurt was a fan of a band I used to be in, Scratch Acid. The jam was very low-key, but I had to play Dave's drums the way he had set them up for himself. Chris showed up, and fun was had by all. Later that night, we went to go see Guns N' Roses at the Kingdom. Seattle's old sporting and concert stadium. In addition to this instrumental demo of Sentless Apprentice featuring Ray Washman, there is a demo of the song with Kurt Cobain. This Kurt Cobain demo was released in 2004 as part of the With the Lights Out box set. Interestingly, this demo is more than twice as long as the finished studio version of Sentless Apprentice. The studio version of the song officially clocks in at around 4 minutes, whereas the demo clocks in at around 9 and a half minutes. Lyrically, Kurt Cobain was largely inspired by a German novel named Perfume. It was written by author Patrick Susskind and released in 1985. Spoiler alert, the book essentially is about an orphan who has a very strong sense of smell and eventually ends up doing some very dark things in order to create specific types of perfumes. As is the case with many of Nirvana's songs, with Sentless Apprentice, Kurt Cobain took inspiration lyrically from very dark subject matter. The first time the band performed the song live was in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil on January 23rd, 1993. Just a few weeks before the In Utero sessions took place from February 12th to 26th, 93 with producer Steve Albini. The song would not be released as a single, though Kurt Cobain had publicly stated he wanted Sentless Apprentice to be the second single off of In Utero. In any case, it remains one of the standout tracks on the album for a variety of different reasons. Now, in addition to these early recordings and the studio version of Sentless Apprentice, a live version of the song was also released. Nirvana's rendition of Sentless Apprentice from their December 13, 1993 show in Seattle was released on From the Muddy Banks of the Wishka in 96, Live and Loud in 2013, and the In Utero Super Deluxe in 2013 as well. In Steve Albini's view, Sentless Apprentice and Milk It are two of the songs that stand out on In Utero because they represented a change from Nirvana's more melodic material. As mentioned, I did an interview with Steve Albini about the making of In Utero. If you'd like to see the full interview, it's linked in the description box below. In one part of that interview, Steve shares his thoughts on Dave Grohl's drumming, and in particular, his thoughts on Sentence Apprentice. I'm going to show you that clip right now. If you guys like what you see and you want to support, make sure to subscribe for more. 
Everything I do is 100% DIY, and your subscription does go a long way to help support this channel. Thanks for watching. What was your favorite song to work on during the recording sessions? I remember really liking the Milk It song. Uh, really? yeah. And then there was the one that we were calling the name game. Uh, the one that goes ba 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 da ba da 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 uh, Sound of Sopranos? That, yeah. Um, I remember at the time, it's it, uh, Dave Grohl called it the name game because mm -hmm. the, the rhythm is sort of Charlie, Charlie, Fo Farley, Banana, Fana, Fo Farley. Like that, it has the, the same rhythm as the name game. Yeah, I thought that was a really distinctive use of that rhythm, which I was is underutilized. And what is the name game? It's that pop song from the 60s. A lot of people say that Dave Grohl's intro on Teen Spirit is his most iconic drum intro. I, I really find that the Set the Sopranos intro is his best drum intro. How did you record the drums? He's at the very, very top of, of my experience recording drummers. Extremely powerful drummers. Pardon me. No worries. Can you believe they're still doing robocalls? <laughs> really? <laughs> Even with the virus going on? <laughs> so my skill set with uh, recording drums developed over the years by recording the loudest and most aggressive drummers out there. I was able to use a fairly normal approach that is close mics on the drums, distant ambient mics to capture the room sound. My approach to the drum kit is not to try to record the individual drums as isolated sounds, but to record the whole of the drum kit in the set. I've always thought of it sort of as a kind of bully's piano, you know, huh. like you wouldn't try to record the individual strings and hammers of the piano and then reassemble them in the mixing stage. You try to capture the sound quality of the whole piano and present it that way. You can shift the emphasis one way or the other using mic placement or technique, but the the net effect of it should be that um, it should evoke the sensation of listening to a single instrument. And that's the way I've always approached the drums is you might have a mic that's special that's specifically for the bass drum, but you're not recording the bass drum in isolation of the other sounds. There, there's a microphone that's recording the snare drum, but that microphone is also hearing the rest of the drum kit in the ambient environment, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. I knew that in their position, Nirvana were going to be badgered by other people wanting to glom on to their success and wanting to siphon off some of their credibility for themselves and that they want that there were going to be a lot of people leeching off of them for my own peace of mind and for their peace of mind i wanted them to know that they didn't have to worry about me and be confident that i was going to do a good job without any of the distractions of the celebrity lifestyle or any of that sort of thing